So let me introduce our next speaker. And welcome to Gothenburg. <laughs> uh, Sora Kaur is uh, director, Development Director and Deputy CEO, National Holocaust Center and Museum, United Kingdom. And you've been working with an exciting project for three and a half years involving Holocaust survivors. And now right. you're going to explain something about it for us. Fantastic. Well, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, great, fantastic. Um, well, thank you as well for inviting me to come to speak and share the work we've been doing over the past three and a half years. I've never been to Sweden, so it's a great opportunity to come here. I've only seen the airport and the conference centre, so I'll have to come back and, uh, and see more of it. So it's a real privilege to share this project. It's one of those pieces of work that really gets into your heart and has been a real privilege to work on with Holocaust survivors over the past three and a half years. And one of the key issues about the project was how do you connect witnesses of history, people that have seen events, that have experienced them personally, how do you connect those people to future generations that will never have the opportunity to meet them? So I really want to tell you a little bit about the project and, and what we were able to achieve. But first, I just want to tell you about the UK's National Holocaust Centre and Museum. We are a national museum, but we are comparatively small. We don't have a huge number of visitors. We have around 30,000 visitors each year. But our focus really is on <coughs> depth of the educational experience. So the vast majority of our visitors are school children both primary school children and secondary school children. And they work on very in-depth educational programs whilst they visit the site. In addition to that, we are leaders in primary education in the Holocaust field. So we run international conferences. We do a lot of work on hate crime and a lot of work on issues such as refugees and identity and really looking at how the past can inform um, communities today. In terms of our, as I said, our real focus is on educational programmes. We have two main exhibitions. One, the Holocaust exhibition, which is suitable for secondary school children and adults, which really goes into the history of the Holocaust, the history of anti-Semitism, the rise of the Nazi party, the rise of the right wing and what that means to societies today. We also have an exhibition quite unusually for a Holocaust Centre. We have an exhibition which was specifically designed for younger children. We really work with kids that are sort of 9, 10, 11 years old. And that exhibition focuses on the experience of a 10-year-old German Jewish boy who it really examines his experience in the late 1930s, how his family and um, he, him personally suffered persecution and the breakdown of his relationships within the community. And it follows his experience over a six-week period prior to the Second World War and his escape to the UK on the kinder transport. That exhibition is only one of three in the world that were particularly designed to work with younger children in the field of the Holocaust. And it has no text at all. It's a completely immersive exhibition following Leo Stein's story from his home to his school to the November pogrom, um, Kristallnacht, as it's otherwise known, and his escape to, to the UK, as I said, on the kinder transport. So for us, because of our main, our main audience is children, it's so important for us to develop a, an engaging, um, interactive, personal experience for the kids to really get them involved in the history. As part of the educational programme, one of the key things that the kids experience at the end of their exhibition tours at the end of the workshops, at the end of um, their opportunity to visit the memorial gardens, is every single person who comes to the centre can meet a Holocaust survivor. This is Eric Hirsch who speaks regularly at the centre. We tend to have two Holocaust survivors speaking every day to children. And Eric's story is incredible. If you have the opportunity to have a look at his story online, then I'd really encourage you to do that. 
He survived Auschwitz as well as, another, uh, the, as well as the death marches and has some very disturbing but also inspiring stories to share with future generations. This is Eric meeting one of the secondary school children after his talk. And I think the thing that really strikes you when you actually have a survivor in the room talking to the children, even when you have teenagers who are 13, 14, 15, and they don't really want to be in a school trip, there's absolute silence. And they attend to that story so well and so meaningfully. And quite often at the end of a talk, the, the kids will go up to the survivor and want to engage with them, want to ask them more questions, uh, want them to sign, uh, sign the book about Eric's life story. So we find that testimony, that personal testimony, has such a key role to play in helping children understand that this history is not just history, it has something to tell them. One of the key things we find is that particularly with a subject like the Holocaust, which is very, very difficult to, to deal with with young people. Both children and adults find it difficult to comprehend the millions of people that were murdered during that period of time. And so it's by connecting with an individual testimony, an individual story, an individual life, that those children start to understand the scale of the loss. And that is key to them moving forward with, with that history and that understanding. So it has a huge impact on both children and adults. But of course, we had um, a major problem. We knew that this personal testimony was an absolutely fundamental part of the education program. But our survivor speakers are in their 80s and 90s. We have one survivor speaker who was born in the camps. She's obviously our youngest speaker but she recalls the memories of things that her mother had told her about the experience. So these are just some of the survivors that s spoke at the centre regularly and have since passed away. Uh, Paul Oppenheimer, Gina Schwarzman, who died very recently, um, Val Ginsberg. And it's a real issue for us that those personal stories were going to be lost. But more importantly, not just the stories, because there are thousands of sort of plain video of Holocaust survivor testimony, and quite often those plain videos last for about two hours. I mean, in the best world in the world, you're not going to get a 13, 14-year-old child or a nine-year-old child sitting down and watching a video for two hours. Uh, one of the things we were really concerned about losing was at the moment the kids have the opportunity to ask the question, ask a Holocaust survivor a question about their experience and get a response to their question, the thing that they care about. So we really looked at how on earth are we going to solve this problem for the future. Um, my daughter's nine, and at the moment the Holocaust survivor testimonies that are shared with 14 year olds she will probably never get the opportunity to meet somebody who's been through the camps so it's how we how we actually enable that to happen so we really threw the question out there to the technology community and said how do we preserve the experience of speaking with interacting with a holocaust survivor how do you enable children of the future to ask that survivor questions and get a response so the proposal was to use high quality, ultra, ultra high definition 3D filming techniques to recreate the sense of presence in our memorial hall, which is where the survivors currently speak, and to enable Holocaust survivors to be permanent narrators of their own personal stories and to give the audience the opportunity via the application of different technologies to ask questions and to get a response from that person. Not just to provide the story going forward, but really to try and provide that connection between the historical witness and the future generations. This was the original visualization of what the project would look like when it was finished. So I can tell you about whether, how we achieved that or whether we achieved that in a few minutes. The team we put together for the project was a combination of our 
team at the National Holocaust Centre, in particular our educational team, who had a really, really good understanding of the children and also the individual Holocaust survivors. We also worked with interpretive design company Bright White Limited, who are specialists in digital interpretation and design, and the University of Huddersfield. Professor Eunice Marsh he is um, head of the leader of digital games and media at University of Huddersfield, and has got a particular interest in how you can use natural language processing and other techniques as, as an interface. We were fortunate to get funding from a range of different funders, not all of whom are recognised here, but the UK Heritage Lottery Fund, R&D Digital Fund for the Arts, and the Pears Foundation, which is a major Holocaust education funder. We also worked in collaboration with the University of Southern California that's doing similar work in, in the US and the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies. So in terms of kicking off the project, we really firstly had to look at, it was quite an interesting project because rather than thinking about digital from the point of view of let's do something completely new, we were looking at it from the point of view of how do we preserve and replicate what we're doing now? which was brilliant because we actually had a model to examine right at the beginning. What problems are we actually trying to solve? So uh, we really analysed what happens in the Memorial Hall now with Holocaust survivors. And you really have three individuals or, or groups that are involved. You have the facilitator or the compare, which is normally an educator who's hosting the session. You have the survivor who's giving their talk and answering questions. And you have the audience. And we looked at how the interplay between those different groups happens, who's listening, who's speaking, who's introducing, what's the flow between those groups, and what happens when somebody asks a question. Now, it might seem blindingly obvious, but all of these had little technical issues to it that we knew we needed to solve in order to try and replicate that experience. And we wanted it to be as natural as possible, so we wanted it to be reflecting the use of the microphone, for example, with an audience. Um, how does the compare or the facilitator walk over to the audience with the microphone to ask a question? So we really wanted to go into, into that detail. So that was our first step. After we'd done that, we started to think about how can we take a Holocaust survivor's story and analyse that in order to elicit the questions as best as possible that would be asked by future generations. One of the advantages we had was that uh, if you take Holocaust survivor Stephen Frank, who was the first person to go through this process, we know Stephen very well. He's spoken at the centre for almost 20 years, probably about 15, 16 years. He has donated artefacts to our museum and speaks on a very regular basis. And he's got quite a, a, a complex and interesting story with a lot of different characters involved, his family, people who supported him. And he's also got a lot of uh, different geographical locations, places where he was moved from, place where he was born, the place that he was moved from, the place that he, he, was, he was forced to move from different camps. So we started to look at how can we build a really, really strong methodology to develop those question sets to be ready for the filming. Now, I know you're not going to be able to read this because it's too detailed, so don't worry. But um, it just gives you an example of how we started to map the timeline of Stephen Frank's life. This is him as an individual. Analyse the transcript of his existing testimony. We mapped his life from his birth to his arrival in, in the UK. And we used different themes to colour code and analyse that experience. And that really provided a map that was then used by a multidisciplinary team to brainstorm the questions that we would need to ask Stephen during the session. And that methodology was extremely helpful. The team we had to develop those questions included educators who knew Stephen Frank's story very well, informed by the questions that children ask. It involved our interpretive design company. 
It involved historians and researchers. For Steve and Frank, we developed a list of 1,001 questions. That was a split between around 600 of those questions were questions that could have been asked to any Holocaust survivor. So they were fairly generic questions. Did you have a tattoo? You know, those sorts of questions that you might ask, ask any survivor. The rest of the questions were only questions that really would have been asked to Stephen because it was about his story. Because we found that those are the questions that kids tend to ask. So um, when they're meeting somebody personally, they've just listened to Stephen's story. They want to know about Stephen and what happened to his mother and his, his uh, brother. Um, why did Stephen act in a certain way? Why, why did his father... Um, how did he feel when his father got arrested? How did it feel when Stephen got attacked by a guard dog? Very, very specific questions about his story. The other thing that we found very interesting and really important to capture in this process was that kids ask some really unusual questions. And um, there's a huge range. And they could go, for, particularly, uh, particularly primary school children, primary school children have no fear about questions. They haven't reached that awkward teenage stage where they're slightly embarrassed to put their hand up. So we had questions from the very, very simple that we knew that people get, would get asked. What's your favourite colour? Um, what football team do you support? Uh, do you have a pet? Uh, and really sort of simple questions like that to really hard-hitting, challenging questions. Do you wish you hadn't been born Jewish? What was the last thing your mother said to you? Um, how do you feel about, about Germany? How, do you forgive people? Do you hate? And so the huge, huge range. And we really, although some of those questions you might feel like, what's your favorite color, for example? Is that really worth us capturing? It is because it connects that human, the kid's voice and the kid's questions to the historical witness. So it makes them feel like you are connecting with a human being. We also asked, what's your favorite joke? Which is a great one. <laughs> so having brainstormed and developed a, a very large question set, we then had to go through prioritizing all of those questions, which was a complete nightmare because everybody felt all of the questions were equally important. So that did take us a little while. But one of the key things about that is we knew we were going to have five days filming. So each Holocaust survivor we filmed was filmed over a five day period. The first day we spent, the first half day we spent recording their testimony. Mm -hmm. The rest of the four, four and a half days was recording their answers to questions. So the prioritization of the questions was really key because at that point, particularly with Stephen, we didn't know how well he was going to be towards the end of the week, whether he'd be very tired. So we wanted to make sure we'd covered a lot of the key questions earlier on in the week. We made sure, particularly working with people of this age, we made sure that they were very comfortable within the studio. We particularly chose a small, friendly studio, it had all the equipment we needed, it had all the quality of 3D filming we needed, but it was on quite a human scale because we needed them to feel very comfortable with the environment. A lot of them within this five-day process actually shared things that they'd never shared before because they felt that this was their last opportunity to share everything that they, that they had. There were some instances where people have actually told us that during their lifetime they don't want us to use the answers to some questions because they're not prepared for that to be in the public domain yet, but after they've passed away they are. We made sure that all of the interviewers were people that knew that individual very well, so we didn't use journalists as interviewers, we used our education team who knew Stephen Frank and knew the other participants very well to make them feel feel comfortable and well looked after. The process for data gathering and verifying the 3D film was quite 
arduous because we need we knew we weren't going to get these people back it was going to be five days of filming and we really didn't want to call them back if anything had gone wrong so after each 40 minute filming session we did a sort of audit and check on the data that had gone through so that we could make sure if we did need to do any pickups uh, or ask any of the questions again we'd be able to do that and that was that that managed pretty well um, we saved about half a day at the end of the week to re-ask questions if we needed to give them another opportunity to share something if they felt that they hadn't covered covered an answer as well as they would want to. So after that filming session, we had about 20 hours of ultra-high definition 3D film. For Stephen, it was covering 1,001 answers as well as his testimony, which is a fantastic sort of personal archive. And then we looked at how, do we, how can we use that material to create a very fluid ex experience which would replicate an audience meeting a survivor, listening to their testimony and asking questions. And that required us to integrate a number of different existing technologies combined with some new approaches that we, we developed ourselves with the software company that we were working with. It involved employing natural language processing so that you could take a verbal question, convert it to text, send it to the system. The system would use that text to identify the right video clip and then play back, which sounds like it's going to take a long time, but I'll talk about, talk about that in a minute. It also involved us doing some work on the digitization of the human form. So all of the survivors were scanned so that we could recreate them as a CGI version as well. But every time the survivor speaks in the project at the end, they, it's real video, it's, real, it's, it's actual digital capture of them. But we wanted to make sure there was some blending in between the different question and answers so that there wasn't a jump cut between the answers. There was some more fluidity. So we created a CGI version of each of the Holocaust survivors. We're still in the process of that with some of them. And then applied real-time image processing to enable that fluidity of movement. We also obviously needed to look at most appropriate stereoscopic projection techniques because we wanted a life-size projection of the Holocaust survivor. Uh, at this point, as you will know, there isn't a, at, that, at that time there wasn't a screen large enough to do auto-stereoscopic projection. So we have actually used a, a back projection system which does require the audience, if they want to experience it in 3D, to use glasses. But obviously in the future that won't be, won't be necessary. So this, you can't take a photograph of a 3D image, obviously, so I have to po apologise to you for the quality of this photograph. But this is in the Memorial Hall during some of our testing phase. That is a photograph of the 3D projected image of Stephen Frank, who is seated in the place that Holocaust survivors would be seated in our Memorial Hall. And you can ask digital Stephen, a question using a handheld microphone. This, I just thought we might be interested to see a couple of comments from some of the, the young people that we've tested this with. So um, this little girl, Gemma, I think her name was, is asking Stephen a question through the handheld microphone, which is specially designed. There's a special button on the microphone where it normally operates as a normal microphone, but as soon as you press the button, that gives it the cue to pick up the voice, convert it to text, and then send it to the, the system. And the feedback we found excellent because, as she said here, it felt like you're actually getting an answer from a real person. The speed of the response is pretty, we've been quite impressed with that actually. It sounds like a natural pause you would have if you asked somebody a question and they had to think about it for a pause. It, it's, it's, that, it's that rapid. The main delay is actually the natural language processing rather than anything else. This is another, another little girl from the same group asking a question. I love this quote. I, she says, I really enjoyed it because he sounds like a really nice man. And he must have a lot of memories that he really wants to tell but can't. And the thing I loved about that was that 
she knows he's a real person who's had real experiences and who, who wants to share his story. And she has a sense of him as being a really nice man, a person and not just a video. And these aren't the sorts of responses you get if people are just watching a film. So where are we now? Um, we've filmed 10 survivors to date. We haven't processed all of that yet, but each survivor has been asked between 850 and 1,400 questions. Big prize for the one that asked for, answered 1,400 questions. And we're really finding that it, it, it is enabling us to build that relationship between the history, a witness of the history, and people today. Just I'd share a few sort of challenges and benefits of the project. Interesting, one, one of the challenges we had was developing a common language between the technologists and the educators, historians and researchers because the technologists were talking in a certain way and using certain phrasings that the educators are finding quite uncomfortable. So there's actually a bit at the start where we really needed to get everybody on the same page and um, speaking the same, same language. Commitment in terms of time and budget was obviously a challenge. One of the key things was that although it was a highly digital project, a lot of the work was not about digital work. It was about the question generation. It was about prioritising the questions. It was about engaging the children. It was about understanding Stephen Frank's story, uh, mapping his timeline. So I think we had a better understanding that a lot of these very complicated digital projects, are actually, at least half of it was nothing to do with the digital process. It was, a, it was about history and it was about our cultural environment and our museum. The other thing obviously was our building awareness, R&D is definitely R&D. And now that we went through that process with, with Steve and Frank and the others, we learnt an enormous amount and now have the whole methodology down to a very smooth and applicable um, method and approach that can be applied to different environments. But at the time, in any R&D project, there are things that we needed to revisit, things that we'd got wrong, technical things that we needed to overcome. In particular, actually, with the hardware and the projection, we were trying to find a needle in a haystack where there was a glitch that we couldn't identify, and it turned out to be a faulty cable, but it took us about <laughs> three weeks to find out what it was. So I think that was just building our understanding of what the implications of R&D are. But the benefits for us, obviously, we've been able to preserve an ex a really, really important experience educationally in our museum and hopefully elsewhere as well. But more than that, I think we're now seeing what the benefits of the digital experience can be. At the moment, there's a group of, say, 100 or so kids in our memorial hall. They've listened to a testimony and then perhaps two, three, four of them will have the opportunity to ask a question because of the time limit of the session. What we're looking at now is there is absolutely no reason why that needs to be the case. If we can create an online or more accessible version of this question-answer uh, method, then the kids that are too shy to ask a question in the session could go and ask Stephen Frank a question when they get home. And the kids that might want to explore it more will have the opportunity to do that from afar. And if we can achieve that, I think that will be a massive huge asset which we're quite excited about and we'll really sort of take it beyond what we're currently doing. Obviously the engagement between the children and the, the subject has been absolutely critical and it's making a huge difference to our work but also that huge archive we now have of personal testimonies. We've got 20 hours of film for each of those 10 and we've also lastly had a lot of attention for our work and the work of the museum which is helping us to contribute to the Holocaust education field internationally as well as nationally. And then just a couple more points in terms of how, it's, how the project has really enabled us to transform our organisation. 
we know that we can now be ambitious about how we use digital. We are aware that you need to accept the fear of doing something new, but it's worth pushing the boundaries. We're a very small museum and the project was quite expensive. It was the equivalent of our annual turnover. But having done that, it's really released our creativity going forward. And we're now approaching digital work, the integration of our digital work and the physical museum in a completely different way as part of a continual journey. So I hope that was helpful uh, and gave you a good overview of the project. I'm really happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. You've really worked hard with making survivors of the Holocaust survive for the future. And I think it was really interesting to your question, what problems are we actually trying to solve? That's a good question to answer you any time. So do we have any questions? Yes, please. Could you please raise and say your name? And I will repeat the question, or you'll repeat the question. Uh, Daniel Sjöberg, uh, from the National uh, I was wondering if um, uh, it was very interesting, first of all. Uh, but do you know if there is any similar projects uh, in other Holocaust um, museums or institutions? It, so, it, it would be a, um, a good way to, to continue. Completely, yes. So, so the question was, are there any other similar projects in other Holocaust museums? So we're working in collaboration with the University of Southern California. So they are doing a similar project to ours, and we've been working collaboratively. So there's some overlap, um, a sort of Venn diagram, a kind of dovetailing on some of the, the tech. Uh, there's one element of tech that we're, we're commonly using. And we're in close connection with them in terms of the Holocaust survivors that they're filming. They've taken a slightly different approach in some areas, but... It's, there's quite a lot of shared learning, which is great. We're really keen to work with other institutions and Holocaust memorials and archives, actually, both nationally and internationally, not just on our 10 survivors, but also looking at whether there are other applications. Yeah. Please. Yes, um, I'm Jörn Köblom from Stockholm University and the National Technical Museum. Museum of Science and Technology, yeah. Uh, so this is really, really interesting. And I have a sort of general question about um, dig digitization of persons and witnesses. And of course, I mean, this, of course, it's really important to get this sort of history absolutely right. So do you see any risks in, involved in sort of digitizing these persons and um, sort of getting into uh, Simu simulations and sort of falsifying things through these sorts of techniques. So did everybody hear that? Uh, so it was about the uh, any issues around digitizing individual people and um, any problems in terms of authenticity. I think probably. So we thought we thought about that very carefully at the beginning, and one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that any time the Holocaust survivor speaks, it is real video, it's real film. So the digitization of the human form is only applied to the pause points or the listening points of the gaps, and we've made that very clear. We also made sure during the recording process that each question and each answer were tagged so that we have a record of the question that was actually asked against their answer. And that is sort of witnessed, if you see what I mean. So if there are any queries or questions about the authenticity of the response or what question was actually asked, we've, all, we've got all of that recorded. Um, I think that there, in these circumstances, there is already a lot of Holocaust survivor testimony out there. And the Shoah Foundation in the US who is sort of leading on ethical issues around Holocaust survivor testimony, having done quite a lot of studies in this, decided that it's better that it's out there and freely available than anything else. 
So I think you just have to go into it in a careful way that you're recording everything and making sure that if there are any issues, for example, with Holocaust denial in future, that you, you, you've got everything recorded in an appropriate way. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Will you stay for the rest of the day? Most of, uh, part Most of, it, of it, but, but I'll probably be going, I need to get my flight. We so. might have the opportunity to ask you do, having, during having coffee. No more questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank it's the you. The same gift. Oh, thank you. That's all I have. Thanks very much.